Hi there, welcome back. This is Dr. Sue Shard with a video about methylene blue, primarily focusing on its use as an antidote in treating acquired methemoglobinemia. The objectives for this presentation are that when you're finished with the video and studying any related course materials, you should be able to identify at least three medical conditions with indications for treatment with methylene blue, and to identify for which of these is methylene blue considered an antidote implying that it is used to treat toxicity from some other drug or toxin, be able to explain methylene blue's mechanism of action, and to describe the indications and dosing of methylene blue in treating methemoglobinemia. First off, what is methylene blue? Methylene blue is a deep blue dye that has multiple uses in clinical medicine. It's a dye, so it can be used to stain samples for microscopic analysis. When injected, the dye can be transported within the body so it can be used, for instance, in cancer patients for sentinel lymph node biopsies. The idea here is to inject methylene blue near a tumor, and then when the surgeon dissects out the regional lymph nodes, they can see which one receives lymphatic input from the tumor because it is dyed blue. So that node can be removed and inspected to see if the tumor is spreading through the lymphatic system. Similarly, you can assess the patency and connectivity of various cystic and tubular structures by injecting methylene blue in one area, in this example a renal cyst, and seeing where the dye flows to. Those examples of medical uses on the previous slide relied simply on methylene blue as a dye. However, when used as a drug, where it affects cellular biochemistry, the mechanism of action of methylene blue relies on its interconversion with leucomethylene blue through a redox reaction. As we know, methylene blue is indeed blue. But when it gets reduced by adding electrons, it becomes leucomethylene blue. The prefix leuco literally means white, for instance as a leukocyte is a white blood cell. But the leuco in leucomethylene blue is meant to imply a lack of being blue or any other color because it's colorless. And if you then remove electrons from leucomethylene blue, oxidizing it, you get methylene blue back again. So we can predict that methylene blue could act as a cofactor in various oxidation reduction reactions in the body. Speaking of redox reactions, here we see how the ferrous or plus 2 iron in the porphyrin ring of hemoglobin can become oxidized to the ferric or plus 3 state, becoming methemoglobin. We live in an atmosphere of 21% oxygen, so there is a constant pressure towards biologic tissues becoming oxidized and living things have evolved mechanisms to reverse or reduce these oxidative changes. I've also indicated a color change, where normal hemoglobin is its typical shade of red, while met hemoglobin is darker and more muted. Here on the right side of the slide, stylistically shown as purplish, but in reality it's more brownish than purple. These blood samples along the bottom show the progressive color changes seen as the percentage of met hemoglobin increases. Since methemoglobin doesn't carry and deliver oxygen to tissues well, you can imagine that patients will have more signs and symptoms of hypoxia as methemoglobin levels increase, and that some patients might develop signs and symptoms before the blood color change is grossly noticeable. I mentioned that methemoglobin is brownish, and you often see it mentioned as chocolate brown in the medical literature. Here on the right side, we see some very notably brown blood specimens from patients with pronounced methemoglobinemia. This discoloration of the blood can be seen externally too, since blood pigments do affect skin tone, particularly in lighter skinned individuals. Patients with methemoglobinemia are often mentioned as appearing cyanotic or having a slate gray discoloration. Cyanosis literally means blue but it's not exactly the same shade of bluishness seen with hemoglobin desaturation from hypoxia. However, it's close. If it's not blue, but kind of looks blue-ish, we might say there is pseudocyanosis. Here we see a young woman with moderately darker baseline skin tone, and she looks markedly cyanotic on the left photograph with blue, purple tongue and lips when she had 64% met hemoglobinemia. I mentioned already that our hemoglobin is constantly being oxidized to methemoglobin. This is happening at a low enough rate, and our bodies reduce it back to hemoglobin, such that our normal methemoglobin levels are limited to about 1%. The reduction of methemoglobin to normal hemoglobin is due to the action of the enzyme methemoglobin reductase, also called cytochrome B5 reductase, in the red blood cells. Methemoglobin reductase uses NADH as a reducing agent, while cytochrome B5 a heme-containing molecule, helps to shuttle electrons around. 
In a redox reaction, if something is being reduced, then something else is getting oxidized. And in this case, NADH, produced from glycolysis in the RBCs, is oxidized to NAD+. So if this process normally limits methemoglobin levels to 1%, how do we get higher levels? Most typically, methemoglobinemia is caused by situations with increased oxidant stress, such that the formation of methemoglobin outstrips our ability to reduce it back again. It's also possible to have a genetic deficiency of cytochrome B5 reductase, but this is quite rare. The RBC oxidant stress causing methemoglobinemia most often occurs with exposure to certain drugs or toxins. Local anesthetics, particularly benzocaine, are well known to cause methemoglobinemia. Other causes include various nitrates and nitrites, both those used as vasoactive drugs and as additives or contaminants in food or water, certain antimicrobial drugs, the anti-nausea drug metoclopramide, also known as Reglan, phenazopyridine, a urinary anesthetic available over-the-counter to treat the dysuria of UTIs, and resburicase, a treatment for hyperuricemia most likely to be used in tumor lysis syndrome. So far we've seen how methemoglobinemia may occur, but not how methylene blue helps treat it. Methylene blue treats methemoglobinemia by augmenting an alternate NADPH-dependent reduction pathway, since obviously the NADH-dependent pathway was not sufficient if we need to consider relying on its alternative. Here we see the normal situation in the absence of methylene blue. The alternate NADPH-dependent pathway exists, but it's not very active. In red blood cells, the enzyme NADPH methemoglobin reductase lacks an electron-accepting cofactor to make this reaction proceed at a satisfactory pace. However, if methylene blue is given, it can serve as the electron accepting cofactor in this reaction, allowing NADPH to be used to reduce methemoglobin back to normal hemoglobin. Also, take note that the NADPH necessary for this reaction comes from the pentose phosphate pathway, in contrast to the NADH that came from glycolysis for the other reduction pathway. So we see that both of the methemoglobin reduction pathways rely on carbohydrate metabolism to produce the reducing agents NADH and NADPH. Glucose first gets phosphorylated into glucose 6-phosphate, and then glycolysis produces the NADH necessary to maintain homeostasis with respect to maintaining normal methemoglobin levels as hemoglobin is continuously being oxidized at low levels. If, on the other hand, methemoglobin levels are too high, and we treat the patient with methylene blue, the glucose 6-phosphate is used to produce NADPH with the first step being catalyzed by G6PD, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. And then some more NADPH is formed, and we have the rest of the pentose phosphate pathway. Methylene blue is given at a dose of 1 mg per kilogram IV for clinically significant methemoglobinemia. And we define significant as levels producing symptoms consistent with hypoxia, abnormal vital signs, metabolic acidosis, and or if the methemoglobin level is 25% or higher. Methylene blue is administered by slow IV push over 5 minutes. It is diluted with D5W since the chloride and saline can reduce methylene blue's solubility. And it is followed by a D5W flush since it can be irritating to the blood vessels. The patient is observed for resolution of methemoglobinemia, and the dose may be repeated if necessary in 30 to 60 minutes. The most common reason why methemoglobinemia might not resolve after the first dose is that there is continued RBC oxidative stress from continued presence of the substance that caused methemoglobinemia in the first place. A potential mnemonic device to remember methylene blue as a treatment here is blue plus blue equals pink. A blue patient from methemoglobin plus a blue drug makes the patient pink up. With regard to potential adverse effects of methylene blue, a few of them relate to it being a blue dye rather than its redox effects. Patients given methylene blue can appear persistently cyanotic. One reason we just mentioned is continued rapid methemoglobin production. Also, since methylene blue is a blue dye, it can temporarily make you blue, but this should be short-lived. As a dye, which by its nature will affect light absorbance, methylene blue can interfere with pulse oximeter readings, making the monitor say the patient is still hypoxic, even if they aren't. Rarely, methylene blue can paradoxically make methemoglobinemia worse. If you are catalyzing a redox reaction, under some circumstances it might go the other way. And if this happens in a patient with G6PD deficiency, who have deficient NADPH production, this extra oxidative stress is more likely to cause hemolysis than in other patients. 
Thus, methylene blue should only be used with caution in patients with G6PD deficiency. IV methylene blue will ultimately be excreted into the urine, where the normal yellow plus blue now equals green. Also, methylene blue is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, so it's possible to induce serotonin syndrome in patients on other proserotonergic drugs. We're going to finish up now with a discussion of two other therapeutic uses for methylene blue. There's a growing body of evidence suggesting a potential role for methylene blue in treating distributive shock, that is to say, shock due to decreased vasomotor tone. Methylene blue has two mechanisms of action here. Methylene blue can scavenge nitric oxide, decreasing its downstream signal, and it can also inhibit soluble guanylyl cyclase. Both of these actions inhibit nitric oxide-induced vasodilation, resulting in relatively more vasoconstrictive tone to raise the blood pressure and improve perfusion. Methylene blue may also have a role in treating the encephalopathy that can result from the cancer drug ifosfamide. Some theoretical mechanisms are shown here where methylene blue interferes with several of ifosfamide's toxic metabolites. If you later do clinical oncology work, this may become more important for you, but for now, I don't recommend that you try to memorize anything on this slide. And that's all I have for methylene blue. I'll be seeing you around.